So you're, you're all very welcome to um, productivity with, uh, with Office 365. And um, just before we get started, um, just to remind everybody, you know, please stay on mute um, unless you're a speaker. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, my audio then uh, here. Go on. Let me ask you, you yours. Yeah. Where we'll, did you go about actually we'll, getting uh, the audio we'll working? Session. Just um, as mentioned already. Um, we aim to finish by, by four, and there's plenty of opportunity uh, when we come to the panel session uh, for, for also uh, asking questions. So I'll start by just introducing who we have on the call with us today. Um, we have um, Simon Daly from Microsoft, uh, Connor O'Connell from TMI, Mark Kane from Recoleta, and Steve Blanche from Ergo. Um, the, the opening point here is to mention that uh, we're in an era of accelerated digitization, and we're in a world in which all of our customers are demanding more faster, better, cheaper, and now. <clears throat> and this means that we're under enormous pressure to become more productive, more productive as individuals, more productive as organizations. And really, in order to achieve this, it is primarily all about digitizing to win. Um, the running order that we have today, <clears throat> I'll start by giving a little bit of a background on how the hub helps your enterprise more broadly and then just narrow in on the, on the key topic for today. Um, Simon Daly, who is the modern workplace specialist at Microsoft, talk about uh, how Office 365 fits into that strategy of modern workplace. Connor, who's the CEO of TMI Ireland, will then talk about personal productivity with Outlook, followed by Mark, who's CEO of Recoleta, who will talk about, in particular, Microsoft Teams, how to get organized Microsoft Teams. And then our, our, our fourth speaker, uh, Steve, who's CTO at Ergo, will then talk about you know, the practicalities of implementing Office 365 in your organization. We'll then have a panel conversation. Um, and you're at all, all the way through this, you are, you are free to um, ask a question, as I said, in the chat room. So just moving on from that then, I'm just gonna start by uh, giving you some background on the hub. So many of the audience, many in the audience today are familiar with the hub, but for those who aren't, I just want to talk a little bit about that. And, and to put it all into context, um, we're in a time of unprecedented change. I mean, COVID has really pushed us into the future. So we think today is the 1st of July, 2021, but of course we're in 2026 in relation to how fast uh, technology has, has moved in this past you know, 18 months. It's a, it's a new reality in which health first is, is, is the clarion call for all of us. Um, our, our personal health, the health of our family, the health of all of those around us. Working from home is a reality in a way that was unimaginable two or three years ago for most organizations. And as mentioned already, accelerated digitization is the new norm. So not only must we digitize faster, we, we are experiencing a world in which our customers are putting us under pressure to digitize. And of course, our competitors, our suppliers, our entire ecosystem. It's a world of relentless 24 by seven uh, competition. And if we think there's any end to this, there isn't. The future is gonna be more competitive than the present. So we can anticipate 2022, 2023 and beyond to become even more uh, competitive than today. Um, one example of this comes from the domain of retail e-commerce. Now in 2020, worldwide uh, retail e-commerce growth was a staggering 27%. So in one year, worldwide retail e-commerce online business leapt forward by 27%. What's particularly surprising is that when you look at North America, it's nearly 32%. So a market which was already the most heavily online market in the world, somehow was able to grow by 32% in 12 months. It's extraordinary. Um, closer to home, our nearest neighbor, 
85,000 UK businesses this time last year launched their e-commerce site for the first time. If you, pick, if you pick a particular global player, Amazon, their global growth was 37% last year. They are, a, they are a, uh, an entirely online proposition as a business and their revenue grew by over $100 billion last year. It was, their, it was the biggest ever growth in percentage terms or in absolute terms for Amazon. And we are now truly in a world in which anyone on this planet who is fluent in English and possesses a good internet connection is your competitor, all enabled by, by, by big change. We're here to help businesses make better decisions faster. We talk a lot about Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, which at its heart is all about that, about making better decisions faster. Um, the term comes from Germany from about 10 years ago, a time when Germany was facing fierce price competition from other parts of the world. So people would work for a dollar an hour in Vietnam, Bavaria, richest region of Europe. So Bavaria can't compete with that. To compete, it's about making better decisions faster. In the BMW car factory, the robot reorders the paint in 2.2 milliseconds. No procurement department, no purchase order, no invoice. It's done instantly. And a million similar decisions made a day in that, in that manner. So competing by, by thinking differently about, about the problems that you face in your business. Ultimately, it's all about productivity, but it requires a new mindset, a mindset in which data is the new currency. It's a mindset where data value is the objective. Um, for those who, who do it and do it well, they end up with a happier customer, a better product, a safer working environment, better asset utilization, and greater profitability. Um, others might say, well, it's not for me. I prefer to manage by gut field and managing with data. Well, for those who say that, um, the problem is that they are then accepting that they have a hidden factory. So all of the cost associated with rework, scrap and delay and incorrect inputs and interruptions, all of that has to be paid for. So the salaries are still paid for in your business, whether or not your people are fully productive. And the problem is that if your competitor has figured this out and removed that waste and that cost and you haven't, well, then they are probably more competitive than you. So what was probably okay five years ago or more than five years ago, you know, many a negative threat. So becoming more productive is what it's all about. I mentioned Amazon already. Um, Amazon are currently building Ireland's largest ever warehouse. Uh, you will soon have Amazon.ie available to, to all of us for same day delivery anywhere in Ireland. They have ordered 800 trucks and vans. You will see Amazon Prime trucks and Amazon Prime vans on the roads of Ireland very soon. So if you wanted to pick an example of a business that has really figured out how to be more productive by using data efficiently, well, there's probably no better example than Amazon right now. So what we do, we're here to help you compete. Um, we, we, we're here to help you boost your productivity and help you uh, look at your products to see, you know, is there an essential digital dimension to the product you offer? You know, can data be a product to your customer from your business or, or is there a layer of automation into your product which would help you uh, increase, your, increase your top line sales? Today, we're all talking about productivity, obviously, but there is the other dimension as well to what we offer. We do this by helping you with uh, assessments of your digital readiness, help you with identifying a project where we can get you up and running on some concepts around this. And also we help you with upskilling. So part of what we're talking about today is part of our upskilling agenda. So I'm going to hand over now to, to our first speaker, Simon Daly of Microsoft. And Simon, you should be able to um, take control yeah. Of presenting. I'm going to stop sharing and you'll be able to start sharing. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Sharon Moyman. Thanks, uh, John. And uh, that's a really interesting introduction. Um, I think it's fascinating when you, it's funny, like when you when you look back on lockdown, I think the, the things we've all definitely learned are the names of the van drivers that deliver to the houses and our, and our air codes. Like we've definitely, <laughs> they're, the, they're the things we're familiar with now because of the massive increase as well as in, in online shop. But it's fascinating when you look at the growth of Amazon alone, 
just in those figures like it just goes to show it, it's an incredible uh, incredible shift of focus i guess what i wanted to do um was just take a few minutes i'm conscious 20 minutes isn't a huge amount of time i suppose when you when you're getting into concepts around productivity what i wanted to do was set a bit of a context can everybody see the screen there we get a thumbs up or something that's great um just around um uh, just around sorry productivity and the evolution of productivity um, but what I want to do is just take a little bit of a step back because I did a similar presentation to, to this around sort of productivity tips um, a while back. And one of the things I looked at were some of the recent insights that Microsoft had seen. Now, this is from probably six, seven months into lockdown. But I think when you frame it in this context, given what the other speakers are also going to speak about and, and how I'm kind of setting a scene for what exactly we mean when we talk about productivity and the modern workplace, I think it's interesting when you, when you see some of the kind of shift to you know in terms of what has happened so just in terms of recent insights as of six months into lockdown we'd seen and, and this is based on sort of telemetry around the use of office 365 we'd seen an increase in scheduled meetings and i guess we all kind of know now from the way we work that the day is very structured which means there's a lot of demands on your time so i think that's one of the biggest challenges it means then you have to be very intentional about blocking time out in your own diary as well to try and allow space whether it's do you know to be creative to do ideation or even just to do the follow-ups on all of the scheduled meetings that you have so you know a massive increase in, in in scheduled meetings that was one of the changes we'd seen and of course a massive massive increase in in video calls um and actually just as a total aside then there's some really interesting research about people's uh, self image when it comes to looking at themselves on a digital you know as a digital thumbnail on a video screen so you know i think there's an awful lot of aspects around how we are engaging through digital medium that aren't fully understood yet like the impact on mental health just the impact on sort of digital fatigue sort of these sort of concepts that um you know it makes it a lot more challenging to interpret images on a video than it is if you're sitting in a room opposite people and, and sort of trying to do the work. So, so th they were two of the big kind of factors that we'd seen. Probably, probably not surprising when anybody looks at their own diary and how things have gone. But some of the other details within it then were that 30% of those meetings were going over scheduled time. So the way we used to work when we were in offices was a little bit more flexible. Now we're being very rigid in terms of how we manage our diary. And the challenge we have is that it's very difficult to really stick to stick to some of those times so so there is a need to figure out how we're working and, and how to put some sort of boundaries and structure on some of that the other boundaries of course are what we're seeing in terms of out of hours work so 52 percent increase in instant messages between the hours of six and midnight so you know i think again the flexibility that people need in their lives particularly when they're balancing sort of home care needs and stuff like that means that the, the whole work-life balance boundary is gone i mean someone in microsoft even coined the phrase the phrase that we're not we're not um we're not working from home we're living at work you know what i mean it, it's effectively like living in your office all the time and you're sort of permanently on so i think that creates a huge challenge in terms of how people need to get some structure back into their day and then a 200 percent increase in teams chats at weekends so again you know further evidence of the of the boundaries kind of really been broken down and, and sort of falling apart um, so I think all of that really needs to, it sort of comes into the point about, you know, well, well, what is it, what does it take to be productive? So when we talk about productivity, we talk about it in terms of the fact that there are multiple needs for a person to be able to get their job done. So, so we see Microsoft 365 as being a broader platform to enable productivity. And one of the ways that we talk about this or look at this is, you know, we're at the center of our working day. Most people still rely on sort of email and calendaring to manage the way they work. But we're also part of other teams. And depending on the size of the organization you're in, you could be part of really broad based communities, or you could be part of very focused, smaller teams. So we have this idea of an inner loop and an outer loop. And then we have the tools at the center of that to be able to reflect how people work and, and a lot of this is what's going to get covered today so the idea of the inner loop is it's the people that you generally tend to know it tends to be time-bound projects um you know it's much more communication and task oriented and then the outer loop is a bit broader so it's maybe communities of practice it's broader you know uh, broader based communications that are happening across sort of the employee level so again some of this will depend on the size of the organization you're in but i, I think that sort of 
that sort of view would feel familiar to people, you know, in that there, there are different types of engagements you have with the people you need to work with. And by the way, it's not all just people in your own organization. The nature of how we work now means that we work with more partners and more external entities that can help us get our job done. And then at the center of it, obviously, is still this idea that, you know, you, you need to manage your own tasks and you need a way to be efficient. A lot of people still use Outlook, I guess, as a system of record. But productivity is about bringing all of this together um, and, and sort of figuring out what does it actually mean to enable you to be able to get your job done. I thought it would be interesting then to, to look back. Like I joined Microsoft in 2015. And when I joined, I was a productivity specialist. So just after I did this slide, I, I realized it makes it look like it's some sort of obituary type slide when, when I put it in, but I just thought it'd be useful to sort of show productivity was my definition, my defined job title, probably from the time I joined 2015 to about 2017. And the focus of that was things like communication, collaboration, the idea of a modern desktop, modern office tooling. So, you know, Office Pro Plus, things like co-authoring, co-editing. It also included aspects like enterprise voice and enterprise social, which is really about a modern intranet. So instead of intranets just being broadcast type content, how did you engage with that? So, you know, some sort of social interaction really, and it was all there really to, to support employee engagement. Of course, when you start talking about the needs that people have when it comes to collaboration, so working with different parts of the organization, breaking down silos, potentially this idea of being able to work from anywhere, there's a whole other aspect to enable productivity that's as fundamental, and you can't really have any of those conversations separately. So it evolved from being productivity into being modern workplace, which brought in another aspect that has you know, previously someone else used to look after. So as I said, you couldn't really have these conversations separately. It was the idea of enterprise mobility. So the use of mobile devices, you know, being able to work from anywhere. A fundamental piece of being able to work from anywhere is you know, the systems being able to validate who you are and what you have access to and whether there's a higher risk if you're outside the network compared to being on the network. It was important then to recognize things around information protection. And all of these pieces really have amplified in the last 12 to 15 months with COVID because we have been all sort of working at home, working at different locations. Uh, you know, the data that we work with has to be accessible from loads of different places now. So this idea of work from anywhere is a mantra for, for, for nearly every organization. But that creates a lot of risks around things like data protection, data governance. So the idea of the modern workplace was to bring a lot of that together. That then further evolved again into this idea of modern work and security. So the role that I'm in now is actually a modern work and security specialist, which brings in so it's all of the other stuff and then starts to bring in the cyber security angle around external threat protection, advanced threat management, you know, uh, ransomware mitigations, you know, protection against spoofing, phishing attacks, all of this sort of stuff. It also brings in aspects around security operations because as complex as the security landscape is getting, we need to have solutions that actually make the operations of that a little bit easier. So how do you sort of demystify some of it, provide kind of single dashboards, single views for people, and, and then provide advanced insights around how people work. Now there's two aspects to the advanced insights piece. One piece is around insights around the sort of threats and attacks that are happening across the organization, or even the insider threats that are happening around how people are accessing what type of information. But the next piece that I wanted to try and cover um, just for a few minutes was, um, was uh, I wanted to cover a piece then around, we, we have a, a capability within the tool set and the idea is to support better working habits. So it's a tool set around analytics that are designed to help people really understand how they work, where are they working, you know, what sort of tools are they using and, and how can they make changes. And we've actually created a bunch of habit playbooks I, I covered this in, in an event recently, and it was like, uh, it was a massive secret that people didn't really know about. And it got huge amounts of positive kind of feedback and I shared more stuff about it. So I thought it was worth including in this, given the, the next kind of, the, you know, given the run of the day and some of the other conversations. So obviously if there's any, I mean, if this does turn out to be an area that people aren't familiar with, we can certainly take questions during the, during the kind of panel session. But I guess what I wanted to show is just that, that evolution of productivity in, in order to be productive, uh, on your own, you know, effectively on your own now doing your own job. It, it takes an awful lot of other foundational items to, to be productive and to be secure. So the idea of working from anywhere is all about remote, um, sorry, remote, secure remote working really is, is the phrase that we use. So I guess that was one piece of the evidence. And then the other piece that I want to talk about now 
is how can we provide people insight around how they're working, particularly to start to get some of that balance back into their day and into, into sort of the management of their diary and, and how they work. It comes from analysing how you work and then figuring out how you create better work habits. I mean, maybe, I don't know, I'm presenting, so I can't really see the, the Zoom stuff, but maybe by show of hands, if people want to put up a show of hands piece, uh, whether or not they're familiar with my analytics. I know when I did it before, almost nobody was familiar with it. Um, my analytics basically is a tool set that helps, well, it, it analyzes the way you work in the background. Um, but the aim of it is to allow you to get a better handle on how you're working. So here's a couple of examples. So it will it will look at content of emails and make suggestions. You know, for example, that you know I I've been email, you've been emailing John Shaw and it looks like you have outstanding actions for John. So it looks at the language where it looks like you've committed to do things, and you can use that with Outlook tasks to be able to manage a task list. So you can, like I get daily digests or weekly digests of emails looking where I can look at the task list and see where I appear to have made commitments that I may not have followed up on. And I can, I can either add that to a task and create a new task, or I can say that it's completed and done. But it's a really, really good way of uh, allowing, I guess, things like machine learning to help you stay on top of your inbox. Because I'm, I'm guessing, like, you know, probably I'm the same, everybody the same as me, that they're drowning in, in email a lot of the time. It just, it never ends. And no matter how much you think you're on top of it, you'll, you'll never really get on top of it. There are, um, there are plugins and, and add-ins that we have for Outlook. So you can, you know, this can all be managed within your Outlook inbox. But there's also a, a sort of a portal website that you can go to that's part of Office 365 that shows you a dashboard. So you can look at things like your focus errors. You can look at your collaboration network, which is always an interesting one. You know, it, it shows you levels or it's like layers of an onion, I guess, of who you are collaborating with. And that's always an interesting one. Like I work in a sales team, obviously. Um, so I would know the projects and the deals that I'm working on. And when you look at the collaboration network, sometimes you realize you're not actually working with the people that you would expect to be working as much as you think. So it gives you sort of insights to be able to really think about the way you're working and, and the impact that that's having. The other piece that's important, and this is becoming a more and more prominent piece, actually, is the well-being piece. So, you know, how much time away from your own productivity tools are you getting? Um, like we've done, we've done a partnership with Headspace in the US and we're starting to roll out some kind of capabilities linked to Headspace around things like, you know, uh, breathing exercises or, you know, short mindfulness exercises at the start or the end of a day. And teams even will start looking at putting this automatically into your calendar based on, you know, the way you work in a given week. And then you get a weekly digest as well, which gives you some tips. Um, but it's a really, really kind of useful set of tooling as i said to help you get an understanding around how you work now this is the sort of stuff i was kind of doing some of this manually where i'd be looking at you know how many calls would i have in any given week how many were internal how many were external but it was sort of manual and i'd be doing it just on sort of spreadsheets and pieces of paper this is actually the tooling looking at the flows of email the patterns in your calendar um, and really sort of presenting you with with meaningful information that sort of moves away from being good feel to being proper hard-based information what we did with some of that, and so I suppose that, that's just a bit more about the, the, the tooling that I've been kind of talking about. Um, you can set reminders for some of the actions and stuff like that. So it really is a helpful way to, to, to build up a plan to improve. But where some of this led to then is this idea of what we call our habit playbooks. So we have four different habit playbooks that are available, um, which basically take behavioral science along with uh, the sort of tooling information to help you create new habits. So it looks at a suggested behavior and looks at the idea of turning that into a habit, gives you an explanation of why it's important. And then you can use it to create a plan. Now, there's a lot of detail in some of the stuff around the plans. You can do it at a sort of individual personal level, or you can do it at a team level, but obviously you would need your team to, to, to opt into it. But the simple ones are, how do I get on top of email? And there's a lot of tips and suggestions in there around how to use email and how to use Outlook more effectively. The other big one is meetings and um, some great tips in there about running meetings more effectively. And I guess every organization is probably as guilty as the next in terms of things like sending out meetings without agendas and stuff like that and, and expecting people to turn up or inviting, you know, 50 different people to a meeting because you need decisions made, but not really focusing on who's going to give you the decision. And then the other important piece is this. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We have a question. 
I was just going to say the, the other important piece then is is stuff like focus hours. So how do you block the time out in your diary to be able to cater for the fact that you've had 10 different meetings and you need to do some follow up on those, you know? And um, so those have a playbooks are available for download um, on the Internet. Uh, we have a couple of different I've included some links here. So we have an, an overview, uh, just a general overview of the offering. There's an introduction about the way you look at some of the settings. But then importantly, there's the have a playbooks themselves. But there's also adoption material for, for, for teams and individuals. As I said, you could do this as a sort of project within your own team, five, six people or whatever. Um, there are some differences in licensing. So some of the stuff is available at a sort of higher end license. But what we've done with most of the My Analytics offering now is made it available all the way down to the sort of lower plans. So it is available for, for, for organizations and for users now on, on nearly all of the plans at some level. Um, I just thought that this would be useful to for people to look at. It's obviously something if people aren't familiar with, they'd have to go and look at it again. But um, it certainly it certainly has made a difference in the way I sort of manage my week because it's given me, as I said, it's moving away from sort of good feeling stuff to being proper insight based uh, insight based analytics, I guess you know, based on on how I'm actually working. So I think I'm probably doing all right for time. I can't. I didn't see just about on time. Are we, John? You're fine, Simon. Grand stuff. Are there any questions on, on any of what I've shown there? Happy to take them during the panel if people are, are still too nervous to talk. How are you doing? This is Ronan McGrain. Um, I'm very interested hey, in the, how are you doing? I was very interested in, in just that whole last section um, about, you know, people's habits and behavior. Yeah. Is, is, is there a, a library that we can access as a, as a 365 subscriber uh, yeah. for my home, but also a 365 subscriber for my business uh, separately. Mm -hmm. Is there a library that will help me understand what's on offer from my statistics, because my analytics, because I'm getting those emails yeah. and I'm starting to recognize them now. I'm starting to, since yeah. my last new, new subscription to 365. It's an is there a library, a library yeah. just so I can access to help me and my team yeah to understand what's available rather than you know me trying to teach them yeah, there is you're right. not teach them all. i think one of the one of the changes that happened was it used to be off by default and your admin had to go in and turn it on but then we made a change where we turned it on of course the difficulty with that is then you turn it on and people start getting the digests without understanding them so yeah there, and one of the links that i have in the in the deck there and i'll make sure john can share the deck is the adoption material so there's a bunch of different guides and material and links available, including some short videos where you can look at it so you can understand, well, what is the weekly digest actually telling me? When, you know, when, I, when I see a certain figure, a percentage figure in me focus hours, what does it actually mean, you know? So yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different material available to help you really understand that. And what I would say is, you know, it, it's well worth looking at, certainly worth looking at at an individual level, but it is worth looking at in an organizational context as well. So that when you, you know, if, if you are, hoping to get benefits from it that everybody in the organization can at least understand what they're seeing at the same time so you do a bit of a sort of launch and a bit of an adoption and change management piece around how to use and how to get the best of it you know well that's exactly it i i work in the lean consultancy space and i focus on lean digital consultancy so you know we're looking for the, to the tools that you don't have to necessarily that exist that we don't have to pay for yeah um, and that and are going to give us some insights with, and this is exactly it so short videos is great so it kind of gives yeah. a very concise educated uh the right information i guess yeah, yeah. so we're very interested in that, that looking at that library i'll have a look as well there might be normally we update some of the training sites so i'll take a quick look at the latest training sites as well and if the links aren't in the deck that i'm sharing with john i'll uh, i'll make sure i include some of those links as well thanks for that ron Okay, so um, we'll, we'll move on to uh, the next section, which is with Connor on personal pro productivity. And thanks, Simon, for that update. I mean, yeah, you've opened our, our minds up to the power of, of the, the tool, uh, My Analytics. And yeah. um, I guess everybody will now, who, anyone who's using Office 365 is probably going to, this evening, try to look at that and, and to interpret it. And uh, Ronan's question very pertinent as well about how best to go about that. And uh, we will, of course, follow up with everyone with the links that you've provided, Simon. Thank you. So, Connor, um, 
you're okay to go next. I'm okay to go next, John. I'm going to yeah. stop. Next I'm going to stop week. sharing my screen so that you can share. Okay. Okay. Right then. So um, let me. Uh, hopefully, you can see. Uh, optimize your personal productivity uh, in front of you there. Is that yep. there? Can you see it? Okay. It is indeed, Connor. Yep, I can see it. Okay, see. good. Good afternoon. And uh, my name is Connor O'Connell. I'm speaking to you from the northwest coast of Ireland. I'm up here in County Donegal. And um, I come from an organization called TMI, which my daughter often tells me is too much information, Dad. But actually, TMI started life as an organization called Time Manager International. And we have been in the business of time management and personal productivity for the last many, many years. But I want to share something with you just to get you, you thinking even at the start of this. And I'm going to jump around. I'm going to use a whiteboard actually some of the time. So hopefully you'll be able to see it. But I'm going to put up a figure here on the whiteboard. And the figure here is 15%. Now, in fact, probably greater than 15%. And what are we saying here? You can, if you adopt some of the things that I'm going to talk about over the next 20 minutes, you can improve your productivity by 15%. And that's not me saying this. One of the guys who said this to me a long time ago, and in fact, he's a colleague of Simon's, is a fellow called Ger Perdesat. Ger is, uh, I, I think Simon, he is director of uh, technology strategy for Microsoft in Western Europe. I think that's, that's his title. And Jer like has been you know, now, yeah. Yeah, you, you probably know. He probably owes you money, Simon, if, if the truth <laughs> be known. That's why he went to Western Europe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jer Perdesat, um, about five, six, seven years ago, I ran this particular program, which I'm going to give you a snippet of, from Microsoft staff, for every, everywhere from Seattle over in Washington, which is their home office, right through to Taipei, Johannesburg included. And we trained thousands of Microsoft staff. And Ger Perdesat said to me, he says, personally, he says, I have achieved and my team have achieved at least a 15% improvement in our productivity. Now, my friends, that's six hours a week. But also, he says, when I first talked to my team about this before we ran the program, he said, I asked them about their personal productivity. And he said, at that time, many of them didn't even know what I was talking about. So we all talk about productivity in the big sense. And we've heard John talking about the importance of the global pressure on us. Anybody with an internet and the English language is a competitor. So you better be productive. Simon has shown us that there are Microsoft tools. The reality is, is that a lot of people don't even understand what personal productivity is about. So what I hope to do is to give you a little bit of an idea of, of what this is and what you can do in order to improve. Um, so, 15%, what, what could that do? That's six, you know, and put a value on that if you think about it. I started in the clothing and textiles industry long, long time ago. And the basic thing in the clothing and textiles industry was if you wanted to produce a thousand shirts every day and each shirt took you 30 minutes to produce, because that's generally what it takes to produce a, a man's tailored shirt. You need 30,000 minutes in order to produce that. Where did you get them from? Everybody who comes to work brings with them 480 minutes in a day. So that's an eight hour day. So you're looking at something like about 63 or 64 people. That is it. That's capacity planning, that's productivity. So if you're getting a thousand shirts, you are using your resource as well. The problem is that used to be used a lot in the textiles and clothing industry, but I meet people walking around and they have no idea at all of their own personal productivity. What are they spending time on? What are they actually, what are they actually doing? And what value are they actually creating? The problem we know is as follows, and that when and Simon just talked to us about it. Emails, all the different channels of communication, instant messaging, your phone is with you all the time. You are on 24-7. There's people asking you for stuff, requesting stuff, you're responding to people. A lot of time people are spending now, and we've seen not only that, but at weekends and at evenings. Simon has pointed out to us, there is pressure on people. So we're charging around and we're busy. The question is, are we focused on results? And if you stop to think about it, what is it that makes people effective? Now, I'd like to pause a moment and get you just thinking about that for maybe 30 seconds. Effective people. Now, what is it 
that makes people effective. Think about somebody in your life. I don't know who it might be. It doesn't matter what their name is. Is there anybody you know? It could be down the football club. It could be a member of your family. It could be married to somebody this way. It could be somebody you're employed. Somebody who really has their act together and they are very effective. Now just pause for 30 seconds and think, what is it about them that makes them so? Now I've got to shut up and just got to let you think about that. And then I'm going to post up some things which I will ask you then whether you agree with or not. So what is it about these characters? Well, a couple of things. One, they are result driven. They come to work every day and their job is to drive results. They are also clearly, they are zoned in about the value of time. They don't waste time. In other words, the resource they have every day is like those 30,000 minutes. They, they do not waste time. We often describe them, they are contract people. They are not estimate people. And what we mean by that is, if I expect something, if you tell me you're going to put a document on my desk at tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, it's 10 o'clock I expect it. I don't want it at quarter past 10. I don't want it at half 11. I don't want it in the afternoon. In other words, they know what it is to be contract. Ireland's not a very good country for this, but we need to get better at it. Another interesting thing that they do is they, con they control the now. And what I mean by that is they control their next eight hours. In other words, if you're not in control of your day, and what we're talking there is a daily plan. If you're not in control of your day, you're not in control of your time. So another thing they do, therefore, is they plan ahead. They almost have a mental radar on and they're thinking all the time, not just about what they're doing now, but what they should be doing and what's coming up and are they prepared for it and are they ready for it? I heard a great quote at one stage. If you talk about football, the player has to think about the next move. The manager has to think about the next game, but the club chairman has to think about next season. So depending on where you are in your organization, you need to be thinking ahead. But a lot of people, again, simply don't do that. Why? Because they're busy. They're responding. And they, they're, the excuses or stuff is, oh, I'm up to my eyes and I'm, I'm worn out. That's the problem. So effective people are take a step back and they're able to see you need to take control over some of this stuff here. Now, let me throw this a little bit more. In order to be able to look forward, effective people have to think about a few things. They have to do things faster. Peter Drucker, one of the great American management writers, talked about effective people do things faster. There's an energy, there's a pace, there's a buzz about effective people. Oh, that's good. Effective people do things better. So there's a quality about what they do. They do it right first time, so to speak. So they do it faster and they do it better. But that's called efficiency. If you think about both of those things, doing things faster and doing things better is about being efficient. What makes people effective is that they do the right things. And that's a really important one. They do the right things. There is no point in doing the wrong things faster and better. You have to do the right things faster and better. And that's where a lot of people tend to go wrong. And that's where the productivity tends to go out the window. Now, luckily enough, somebody has helped us with this. A few years ago, in fact, it's a good few years ago now, a guy became very popular. A book was written called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was written by a guy called Stephen Covey, passed away since. And one of the habits of these highly effective people that he talked about was that they put first things first. Now, strangely enough, Peter Drucker had said exactly the same thing back in the 50s and the 60s. So there's nothing new under the sun, as they say. But they did, they put first things first. So let's think about some of these effective people and how they put first things first. But what Covey popularized was an interesting model, which I'm just going to talk to you about very quickly now. And the model simply looked like this. You come to work every day and you've got jobs to do. Simon used the word tasks. You've got jobs to do. Some of those jobs are high value. 
In other words, they bring in revenue, they add value to the customer, they develop a project, they bring a, 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 a product to conclusion, it improves the team, whatever it might be. Let's be honest about it. We also come to work every day and we get involved in things that are low value. What's low value? It's just, you know, I mean, why am I even doing it? Do you ever find yourself, you know, at a meeting and wondering why you were there? Do you ever find yourself writing a report and thinking, who had the hell reads this stuff? You know, so in other words, what, 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 what am I doing here? But the other thing is, not only is we're talking about importance here, we're talking about urgency. Some jobs are urgent. Some jobs are urgent, and that means that in the next minute, in the next seconds, I need to respond. I need to do this job now. But some jobs are non-urgent. In other words, there's no great pressure on here. I can do it later. Now, if you start to look at this, and I know when I was running the programs with the Microsoft teams and many other teams, including pharmaceutical companies, yeah, 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 Connor, we know all about this. If you look at this, you start to see that there are four different priorities here. And the top priority is the one over here. It's high value and it's urgent. They're the showstoppers. They're the showstoppers. That's crisis management. In other words, there's COVID, whatever it might be. Uh, Matt Hancock in the UK recently. You're on the front of the Sun newspaper. There you go. That's, a, that's what we call a quadrant one situation. There you go. Let's look at the, the lowest level. Down here, we're talking about quadrant fours. What's that? That's watching TV. In fact, the, the watching episodes of Top Gear on TV. Uh, we all, we've all done it, lads. You know what it is. We've seen them all before. Clark's on the trip to the Nile. You've seen it five or six times. Is it high value? No. But is it fun? Yeah, it's nice to do those things. The real issue is what you do second. And the problem for a lot of people is that they do the busy stuff second, the busy, the noisy stuff, the emails, the phone calls, the head around the door, the response, you know, the phone call, the instant messaging, uh, the more emails, more responses, and they spend their time running around. And it's busy and it's noisy and it's proximate, but it takes you away from the good stuff. And the good stuff is the stuff that is up here. Up here is what we call the results box. And the results box is where we actually do things that can drive value and really build results. Now, that depends on your job. But for example, most of you now, if you stop to think about how a business is run, what sort of things should I be really working on? I need to work on my team. I need to work on the finances and make sure that the finances are right. I need to work on new business. I need to work on existing customers. You might call it CRM or customer care. They're the things I really need to work on. Maybe developing new products. You know, so you could write them down. These are what we call your key areas. And Microsoft have a word for these key areas. They call them categories. And I'm going to show you how Microsoft used this uh, in, in a few moments. So the thing I want you to focus up here is, if we work on these things, that's where we can add the value. That is the good stuff. That's the stuff I should be working on. Yeah, should you be answering emails? Yeah, but you shouldn't be building your day around answering emails. You should be really looking at what, where can I add value? Now, let me now transition to what Outlook looks like. And again, Simon has talked about it. I'm bringing it back to the very basics of what Outlook can, can look like for you now. So here we go. Now, the first thing I show, show you here, this is actually my Outlook page. And what I've got here is that's my Outlook inbox. I get about 50, 60 emails a day. That's grand. Don't be reading my emails while it's on the screen there, lads, right? So that's the first thing. Now, most people use this. So if you've got Outlook at all, you, that's 100% use. What else do people use? People use calendar. Do you know what I would say? That's my actual calendar for this week. Do people use calendar? I'd say about half the people use calendar. And the only thing they use it for is meetings. And what you can see a lot in there is, is, uh, is meetings there. And the last thing that Simon talked about was tasks. And the problem with tasks is hardly anybody uses them at all. I, I, I say to people, do you use tasks? And they look at me with a, with a face on them and say, what do you mean? I don't know, I've never seen tasks before. But this, Simon mentioned them and Simon uses tasks. And I'm gonna show you, for example, how tasks might work for you. And this is, to me, I think this is the essence of what the brilliance of Microsoft Outlook is all about. So let's just go back here for a moment. And I'm going to pick uh, 
let's let's say data value hub. So here's a message from data value hub. Let's say I open that message and it's simply about um, productivity is about to start. So it's the message that we got earlier on. Lovely. Okay. Let's say I read my email and it's a message from Data Value Hub to say, Connor, we're very interested in what you were talking about today. Could you do a proposal document for us? I can look at Data Value Hub and I can say, right, that is an email. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to bring it down to tasks. And what, what I'm doing is I'm going to copy here as a task with an attachment. Bang. Suddenly it becomes a task. And I can now say, right, when do I need to do this for? It could be John Shaw. John says, I would like this by the middle of July, please. So there you are, there's the 19th of July. When would I like to start it? I'd like to start it on the 12th of July. I might even put some notes down here if I needed to. I can add in lots of stuff about that task. But before I save it, I can go up here to my categorize button. Remember the categories I talked about earlier on? where Outlook prompts me and says, what sort of a job is this? And I might say, hey, that's a new business development job. And it gives it what's called a color category. In this case, it's amber. And I can now go, I can put in lots of information. So for example, uh, I can put in notes about the task. I can attach files. I can attach emails. I can do all sorts of stuff with the task. I don't have time to go into it now. I just want to give you a flavor of this. So once I save the task, I can do save and close. Now you're asking me now, where is it gone, Connor? Aha, uh -huh. it's down here in my list of tasks. Is it there? There you go, data hub presentation, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, and, and what I can do as well, I can not only view my tasks, let me just move this out of the way so I can see my screen. I can not only view my tasks by start date, I can view my tasks, so let me click here, by category. So that means, so if my boss says, what are you doing, Connor, in terms of new business development? I can say to my boss, hey, I'm working on the AR business plan, p and customer experience, the Inspirator training site, the Data Hub presentation, and the starting now. So there it is, that's the one. What are you doing on customer care, Connor? There's my one on customer care. So in other words, I can have visual, I can see my tasks instantly. So I can keep track of them and I can see what, uh, what I'm working on. So if my boss needs to know what I'm working on here, those of you who are bosses and keeping track of your own tasks, brilliant. But not only that, watch, I can now go into my calendar. Now, you heard Simon talking about managing your calendar and managing your diary. Watch this, for example, in most, uh, Outlook, most people leave this thing off. I'm going to switch something on here for you. Watch this. I'm going over to view now, and I'm going to hit what's called the to-do bar. Check out the to-do bar in my menu. At the moment, it's off. I'm going to switch on tasks. Watch what happens. The right-hand side of the screen appears, and now look at what's here. It says, Connor, today you should be working on the Levi Strauss onboarding. You should be working on the Data Hub presentation. There's the AR business plan. So for example, I can now look at my day tomorrow. There's my Friday. Do I have some available time tomorrow, Friday? Yes, I need to do that onboarding job for Levi Strauss. Let me pull it across here, right? Tomorrow morning, half eight, I'm starting that. I'd like to give it, let's say an hour. However, Where's my job for starting now? There it is. Now, it's not due until later this month. So I'm going back up to this one. The TM, Time Manager for Outlook presentation for Data Hub. Hey, check this one out. I'd like to spend some time tomorrow on that. Pop it in. And let me set aside two hours to do that tomorrow. By the way, do you notice as well? Notice the colors. Anything in purple is customer care. Anything is amber is new business development. Anything in yellow is, for example, uh, new program design. So I also need to spend an hour maybe on the interior design group proposal. Suddenly, what am I doing? I am building effectively my plan. So that means I'm looking at my day and I can review my day and see, did I spend an hour? Did I spend two hours? Am I spending the right amount of time doing the good stuff? And by the way, my friends, there's this one here. Check it out. There, what did that start life as? It started life as an email. We saved it as a task. 
And now I can drag it across. Let's say I wanted to pop it into Saturday morning. And now what is it? That has now become a, a calendar event that I need to work on. So there you go, my friends. That is what Outlook can do. And uh, let me use 30 seconds. I was showing this to Microsoft people, their own product in Johannesburg in South Africa. And there was a big guy called Richard Salt. And he was sitting there, what are you doing there? And I said, listen, I'm taking an email. I right click, I drag it into tasks and I turn it into a task. And this is what he said to me. I have worked for Microsoft, he says, for 11 years. I sell this product. I didn't know you could do that. And he turned to his mate. I don't know whether he was angry or he was surprised or he was delighted, but he says, 11 years I've worked with Microsoft. I didn't know you could do that. And he says, that is just mind blowing. So my friends, that, that's my 20 minutes. Uh, this is brilliant stuff. And this is about take control of your time like effective people do. So thank you. And I'll stop sharing at this stage. Back to you, John. Thanks, Connor. That was um, that was superb. Um, I have the advantage of having work having worked with Connor um, in, in previous organizations. But every time I, I hear Connor explain this, I'm 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 I'm, I'm excited and, and uh, amazed every time. I think anyone and Mark, who's also on the call, has similarly worked with Connor before. Um, it's fascinating. The whole concept of adding value and avoiding the, the pitfall of just reacting to emails and, and sticking out of that quadrant four, quadrant three zone of letting urgency just take over your day, but instead to be able to add value by focusing on what's important, but what's not necessarily urgent. Nobody disputes work on what's both urgent and important, but as Connor pointed out, it's what's important, but not urgent, a subtle difference. It's not immediately urgent, but if you don't do it, Today and tomorrow and every day is going to just look the same, as chaotic as ever before. It's also fascinating, Connor, that you you made the point about the difference between contract thinking and estimate thinking. So the fifteen percent benefit, you know, I can see where it comes from by taking control of the calendar, taking control of tasks. Thanks, Connor. Um, Mark is next. Mark is uh, chief executive of of Recoleta, which is a startup. Um, I, I had the good pleasure of working with Mark in the past in renewable energy. We both worked at mainstream renewable power, but I will now hand over to Mark. Um, you're okay to start sharing, Mark? Yeah. So let me know if you can see my, uh, if you can see my screen. Yep. yep. Great. Okay. So uh, thanks very much, John and uh, Connor. Um, I'd, I'd echo what John says. It, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to 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 see and hear you present. Um, you know, we we've benefited enormously over the years from um, you know from from your coaching. So um, I'll give a short intro to uh, to Recoleta. As John says, it's a it's a, a startup. Um, I was uh, uh, formerly the uh, the head of information solutions for mainstream renewable power. Uh, they've recently um, uh, been sold to a, a large Norwegian conglomerate, and uh, that was my my opportunity to uh, to take the jump uh, into this uh, this startup. Um, I won't talk too much about it because the you know the topic is about team productivity with, with Microsoft Teams. Uh, it's very much building upon what what Connor said in terms of you know personal productivity, and then you you work towards team productivity. But you, you can't have team productivity without being personally productive first off. Um, but just, uh, just to plug in terms of uh, Recoleta for, for a moment, um, it's very much, it's, um, you know, as it, as it was with working in, in mainstream, it's all about addressing the, uh, the, the climate crisis. Uh, if you've seen the news this week from the US and Canada, they're suffering from temperatures of, I think, 47, 48 degrees. People are trying to find, um, you know, basements to, to hide out in, to, to, to stay cool. Um, uh, there, there is, uh, we, we saw on Monday, the European Union uh, have um, committed to, to law um, a 55% reduction in, in carbon emissions for the EU uh, by 2030. Um, and, uh, you know, zero carbon by, by 2050 is, is the, the, the target. That's going to trickle down to every, every organization, starting with the large organizations, of which 
a number of forward-thinking organizations have already been active on that. The, the, group, the, the members of the, uh, the group known as the RE100 who are targeting 100% of uh, their energy to be generated from renewables. So uh, what, what Recolette is all about is, is about, um, it's about measuring and, and automating you know, the, the immutable proof of, uh, of carbon footprint of, of an organization from scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And interestingly, um, the COVID crisis, where we were all forced into, into remote working, um, uh, has, has produced um, you know, an interesting outcome there. We see a lot of, uh, a lot of employees are, are not interested or willing to go back to uh, full-time in, in the office. Um, uh, you know, some want to do, uh, do a hybrid approach, and others want to remain working full-time. And interestingly, like the employee commutes are part of the scope three emissions. So organizations are going to have to consider that um, and allowing people to continue remote working or doing what's called a zero commute um, is something with which they can reduce their, their scope three emissions. So um, talking about Microsoft Teams, uh, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to give, it, give a, um, a short demo of just a couple of the features of Microsoft Teams. So as, as we know, Microsoft Teams essentially is what killed off Skype for business, um, but um, it is so much more than that uh, and so much more than just a, a video conferencing solution because what it does is it, it serves this information from, uh, sorry, from, uh, from every other technology in the Microsoft ecosystem. This is the smart energy reference architecture. John will be familiar with this is what we implemented at, uh, at Mainstream first on-premise and then uh, in, in the cloud. Um, so, uh, you know, to use a, a movie analogy as I do at every presentation, Teams is one technology to rule them all, like in Lord of the Rings, um, and it becomes your, your digital hub. So this is where you, you, you start to work more and more. So uh, I've, I've just included this uh, last month, just when I finished up at, uh, at Mainstream, um, you know, our, our Teams journey was showcased um, on the Microsoft Teams channel. Um, I'm including it in there as a link. So I think John will share out the presentations afterwards. Um, you can watch that back. It goes into far more detail uh, in terms of what we did and also in terms of uh, our, our use of Teams. Um, for, for this one, I'll just cover a couple, uh, a couple of the details. So what I want to do now is just switch over to, uh, to Teams. And um, you can hopefully still see that, that, that screen there. So. Um, within Teams, I'm not sure if everybody is a, is a Teams customer or not, but there's, there's the concept of Teams, Channels, and, and Tabs. And the Channels would probably equate, um, I have a chat there, is that, uh, sorry, okay. Um, uh, the, the Channels would equate very much or could equate very much to the categories that, uh, that Connor is talking about. What are your big rocks? What are your quadrant two activities? Um, on, on, on Connor's point, one other, other point to make is that with remote working, a lot of those interruptions that we used to have in quadrant three, the head around the corner or they are being pinged, um, they have reduced somewhat, particularly for people working in technology, uh, because if you're not instantly accessible, uh, it tends to be people have taken the 10 seconds to find out how to maybe you know, unmute or to how to uh, connect up their, their, their Jabra. But, um, just, just in terms of um, what, what you have with, uh, with, with Teams, you, you, have, you, know, you have channels and you have tabs. And one of the great things, and this is one of the things I like particularly about, uh, about Teams, is what's called an app called Planner. You, can, you have any number of, uh, of apps, both Microsoft apps and non-Microsoft apps that you can add in, in context to what your big rock is, what your, what your category is, and one of my favorites is, is using the planner tab. So in terms of uh, the, these areas here, you can add your, your planner tab across any of the big rock categories that you have. Um, and what, what you then have is on the, um, on, on the, the left-hand side, you can actually see across all of your different, um, all of your different categories um, what, your, uh, what, what your tasks are. So, if I, if I give you a scenario, something that happens in Teams quite a lot is that there'll be a team meeting and an email, it'd be a recurring team meeting, and an email will go out uh, saying, here's what we agreed and here's the task, and everybody scrambles just before the next meeting to see 
okay, what's, what's there? What do I need to prepare for? And they might see a task that they missed uh, that was assigned to them. And then they're sort of either coming up with their excuse or as, uh, as Connor would say, they're being estimate, not contract, um, or, or they're scrambling to try and get it done. And where Planner makes life an awful lot easier is by adding a task into Planner, uh, either during or at the end of the meeting, uh, the person is notified by email, um, but uh, they, they have it available here. And the other thing that Planner will automatically do is it will send them another notification when that task is coming due. So they get a reminder. So the, the long suffering manager doesn't spend all of his time reminding the team of what it is that they have to do. Uh, Planner takes over that, that activity. And if you, um, if you impart the culture of contract, not estimate, everybody comes to the meeting and they have completed their task. And ideally what you do as well is when you're marking a task complete, you're going to include a URL uh, or an attachment showing the evidence that, that you've actually done it. So that, that for me is one of the, uh, the, the great uses of, um, uh, of, of Teams is adding the planner app. Another thing that can be done here is uh, in in, instead of people sort of, you know, they receive an email and they think it may be uh, relevant for uh, another group of people, it relates to a category. Instead of forwarding on that email to five or six or seven people, um, instead of doing that, what, what you, you do is you say, well, this was actually came in from Microsoft, it may be relevant. Um, I can actually, uh, from within Outlook, you can say, share that to Teams, and then you can share it to a, a specific channel, and it ends up going directly into the posts here, into what's known as persistent chat in Teams. Now, the great thing about that, that is a, uh, a pull, not push notification. So that's one less interruption uh, to everybody in their inbox, and instead, when they go onto Teams, they'll see the areas here highlighted in bold uh, where there are new, where there has been new information posted. Uh, but another thing that's very uh, useful in that is, is you know, as organizations are, are, are changing and new members join the team, you know, they will never have received that email back that was sent to the, the five team members at the time. But by going into the post and scrolling back, they can, they can see all of the persistent chat. Uh, another nice thing that it's for is that um, uh, they may be a current member of the team, but they might be on annual leave. And we have two options when we're on annual leave is we, we either, um, you know, check in on our email all the time to make sure we're not overwhelmed when we come back to work. Or when we do come back to work, we are absolutely overwhelmed by, by our inbox. Um, and this is one very nice way to reduce down the interruptions to not be sending people um, you know, unnecessary email. This may be pertinent for them when they come back, but they don't need to see it. Uh, they don't need to see it now. So um, the other great things about, um, um, you know, about Teams is, you know, that you can add in any, um, you know, anything you like, really. You can, you can link to any browser-based technology, but particularly you can use whiteboarding and you can be, you know, collaborating directly on whiteboards with people who are working um, in, in other locations. So uh, we, we've established ourselves and we are we're what, what's called a remote first company. Now people work wherever they, they want to work from. We don't, we don't travel into offices to meet up. We, we, work, through, um, we work through teams. So that's just a, a, um, you know, a couple of pointers that, that, I, uh, that we're finding really useful here. But one thing that we have also uh, um, uh, come up with um, is a set of etiquettes that we use around, um, around technology. And some of these start with, with email, I'll just put them up there. Um, uh, others are related to Teams, others are relating to how we, how we interact with our smartphones and also with SharePoint. And what they have to do with is about limiting those sort of interruptions. So uh, Teams has, uh, has, a great, um, has a great app for the smartphone, um, but um, you know, as, uh, as Simon was saying at the beginning, is, is a lot of things are coming up where people are getting pinged at the weekends. You may not know that the Teams app has the ability to set quiet times and also quiet days. So you can, you by all means, have the app on your smartphone, uh, but set it so that your Saturday and Sunday, the notifications don't come through. Um, and even set it to say from 8 p.m. till 8 a.m., I don't want to receive any notifications. Because if something's genuinely, generally urgent, you know, we should say, you know, phone. Um, so that's that's a way to get a bit more control over the um, of, of how you allow technology to um, you know to to interact with you. You determine it. You don't let the technology determine it. 
Um, that's really, you know, very, very uh, it's, it's a very useful um, uh, approach to take um, is look, look at situations where you say, well, where could I use Teams instead of using Outlook? Outlook and email will never go away. It's far too ubiquitous. It's, 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 it's far too essential. But the, the big downside that we have with email is that everything comes in and everything seems to, from the outset, have the same priority. And it's on you to, to filter through, well, what is actually urgent? And by, by using Teams more uh, for, uh, and instead, of, instead of email, you, you can reduce down that burden on, on everybody. So that is, uh, that's really just um, you know, my, um, my introduction uh, in terms of just a few, a few details on Teams. We can talk in the, um, in the panel chat more, uh, but that was, uh, that, that was uh, the key takeaways that I just wanted to, to, to say for people is, you know, Teams, is so much more than video conferencing. If, if people just adopted Teams during, um, sorry, John, I still had the one last slide. Uh, I'll just share again. Um, teams is so much more than just a video conferencing solution. If people adopted Teams for the first time during the pandemic, they may have just started using it for that. But it really is one technology to rule them all. It is your your digital hub where you can do all your work from. And uh, the other thing about Teams, it's, it's great for working synchronously where you're saying you're chatting and calling, but it's also great for asynchronous working. If you're sort of assigning tasks through, uh, through Planner, or if you're posting updates for others to see who may be on different time zones, um, they can see it at a time that suits them. Uh, it's fantastic for, for coordinating uh, projects. Um, and you know, pl a Planner app is, ideal to ensure that people are a contract, not estimate, uh, because it does the reminding for you. Um, you know, make use of channels or you know, categories to, um, you know, to share emails directly from Outlook to reduce down the volume um, and make use of technology etiquettes. And one last thing that, that's something that uh, we, we learned when we, we did this at, uh, at Mainstream, we were, we were fortunate, and it's covered in the, in the video with, with Microsoft, is you want to lock down the creation of Teams because you can end up with what's known as sprawl, and where you know people unbeknownst to each other have, have created multiple teams actually doing the same thing, and you, you've ended up having the same documents in multiple places. So governance is key for teams as it is for, for technologies like, like SharePoint. Um, so that is um, that, that is then um, that's me, me Don John. Uh, I just included my uh, my details there there below. Thanks, Mark. So um, yeah, so it's fascinating what you know that the power the power behind all of that that if uh, within an organization where uh, you know there are several departments, so each department has a Teams uh, channel, but separately for particular projects that that can span multiple departments, Teams is very powerful there to share progress on that. And also this concept you mentioned about synchronous and asynchronous sharing of information. So people are on holiday, they don't need to see everything. But when they come back, they can see the trail of what was agreed and discussed. Uh, you know, a home for all the key documentation on, on the topic and also facilitating people working from home. But it's fascinating, I suppose, that your, your central point at the start there was that Teams is much more than simply a video conferencing service. And... Perhaps that's, that's the big thing for a lot of organizations, becoming aware of this enormous power behind this amazing tool. Thanks, Mark. Um, the, the, the fourth and, and final speaker is uh, Steve Blanche, who's CTO at Ergo. And uh, Ergo are a, are a major uh, Microsoft partner in Ireland. Um, and have done a huge amount of work implementing Office 365 and other Microsoft technologies right around Ireland. So, Steve, are you okay to uh, take control? Thanks, John. Yep, all good. Um, hello, everybody. And good afternoon. Um, just a couple of points I want to pick up on the previous speaker. It's really good. John pointed out Teams being so much more than Skype for business and, and um, uh, reiterating that uh, really, really is. Like I, I recently had a session with um, a CIO in one of the big banks where they were saying, God, we, we, we rolled out Teams and we, we just think Zoom is better. And 
was like, God, you, you've so missed the point. You know, you're using all you're thinking about is video conferencing. Um, and you'll see why in, in what I'm going to talk about in implementing Microsoft 365. Because um, so much of it is about getting people to be able to use the, the products, the technologies, the features, and, and, and glean the value from it. Okay, so so just um, again, uh, thanks for the intro, John. My name is Steve Blanche from the CTO at Ergo. Um, our uh, focus as a Microsoft service provider and um, technology implementer is to deliver uh, best in class technologies to customers. Um, we're specialists in uh, modern workplace. So Microsoft 365, or as it used to be known, Office 365, they changed the name this year. Cloud services, application development, uh, data and BI. So these are all uh, the critical areas that we're focused on. And just to give you an idea of who we are, some of our clients who we deliver those services to, I mean, they're not even all listed there. So we've, we've delivered more Microsoft 365 uh, migrations, transitions than any other partner. And we've just done so much of this. It's been a uh, massive area for us in terms of uh, the delivery. So just to get straight into it, um, as you can see at the top there, they did rename Office 365 to Microsoft 365 this year. But this is just a, a high level overview of our recommended approach to customers going into um, Microsoft 365, Office 365. Key to the success of uh, a 365 project is the acceptance and the adoption. It, as I said, it's getting people to utilize uh, the features. And uh, I suppose the point that uh, Connor was bringing up earlier about the, the Microsoft uh, guy from South Africa, not knowing the power of tasks, you know, to manage your time and so on, just highlights that even more. You know, you may have the, you may have the tools, but if you don't know how to use them, um, they're, they're not that useful. So typically how we engage is we kick off by setting the vision um, and identify what are the business needs. So you're going to start out with what are your how do you work? What do you what what kind of markets are you operating? What's your strategy? Um, and then out of that, we prioritize the specific solutions, uh, and then we create a training and adoption plan that goes along with that. How do we get your your critical resources, which are your staff typically, to 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 basically use these features to achieve those business goals? Uh, then we commit resources um, like teams, project team, and so forth, uh, and execute. And that includes our change management team with an adoption plan. And then importantly, measure success, um, get that feedback, uh, look at the metrics of usage, and then focus on the areas where you're potentially not leveraging the value and enhance those. So that's an overview. Typically how we engage then with a partner uh, to, to get rolled out onto Microsoft 365, it starts out with a phase one, which is a discovery. So understanding you know, what, what exists, uh, what the business objectives are, uh, and so on put a design together around that and then put detailed plans together and then move into phase two, as you can see, core setups, pilot testing, um, change. So get the change communications out to the business that this is happening because typically this is, this is a big change for organizations. This isn't just a new version of office or you know a new version of operating system even. This is a significant change in how people work, uh, something we call new ways of working. Um, so, so it's very important to get that change communications out. This is coming, you'll be doing things in different ways um, and you need to understand how it's going to affect you. The, the training and upskilling um, program has to be implemented side by side. Uh, we deploy and migrate the solution. So create the tenancies, all that kind of stuff, early life support, and then other kinds of support that we can provide uh, either escalation or, or um, full managed services, whatever is required. So looking at that phase one discovery in a bit more detail, when we're setting out the vision, we've got to look at those new ways of working. Um, so targeting specific areas within your organization, within the business, mapping product features to processes, ways of working, and so on. Um, what kind of strategy is your business operating in? Is it growth, consolidation, um, aggressive acquisition? Um, so we've got one customer in the financial services that they've just acquired, I think, something like more than 20 other businesses globally in the past 18 months. Each one has been adopted into their Microsoft 365 environment, um, all of their same you know, teams and uh, uh, SharePoint sites and so forth, just expanded out to incorporate that new acquisition into the business as quickly and effectively as possible. Um, what kind of industry are you in? Uh, your geos, like are you one central headquarters? Are you spread globally? Is it a centralized or decentralized management model? 
then user profiling, information workers, like a lot of us are information workers versus task workers in manufacturing or retail, et cetera. Uh, and then at the output of that is a documented detailed roadmap uh, with a detailed plan of how we're going to implement uh, the project and the plan and the uh, Microsoft 365 services. Budget is obviously a, a primary consideration. Um, and then whether we split responsibility, typically we have the customer uh, might take on some of the responsibility of, of rolling out uh, and, and the adoption and so forth, or we might have to do it all on behalf of the customer if there isn't a skill set within that customer uh, business. Funding availability, um, I said see Simon, because often moving to Microsoft 365, it can be funding available from Microsoft, um, uh, which a lot of customers aren't aware of, but that's there. Uh, priorities and urgency, so I don't know, perhaps there's you know, some kind of burning platform or something happening, you know, you have to get out of existing um, technologies or data centers or whatever um, to move to, the, to, 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 that might affect the scheduling and an urgency around how the project is delivered. And licensing, obviously, a major factor, um, goes hand in hand with the budgets, whether it's basic, advanced or enterprise. So that's all uh, part of the initial discovery. Moving on, obviously, the technologies, what kind of connectivity do you currently have? How are you um, configured for identity and access? Typically, it's Active Microsoft Active Directory, but there are other uh, options out there. Uh, core migrations are typically going to be your, your, your mail services. Um, I'd put Exchange, but it could be any mail service, uh, SharePoint, file and data. That's going to be the core migration uh, content. But then chief consideration is security, governance and compliance. Um, you know, uh, as we've, we've talked about earlier, critical you know team sprawl as, as as you heard is is a massive problem and any customer we've come across especially over the past 12 months because customers have you know just gone out and adopted teams as, a, as an emergency response to covid um without the, the the right level of governance compliance they they have now uh, unfortunately inherited team sprawl and it's really difficult to manage and you do get a lot of duplication and then difficulty in in finding uh, content materials and so on um, but around security then, identity and access control, user admin, um, so, so identity control for users, administration, so privileged, privileged access management, external, so you might have partners or contractors and so forth, how are you going to um, manage them and ensure that they are governed um, properly with access. Multi-factor authentication should be a given for all cloud services. Um, conditional access, so um, what policies will I put in place to potentially restrict how people can access. Do I want them to have um, certain types of devices? Do they have to meet a certain firmware or patching uh, level and so on? Lots of uh, potential policies around conditional access. Then information protection. Um, do I want to protect data specifically, keep it within the organization, be notified if it's going to leave or stop it from leaving, that kind of stuff. Then the program planning. So stakeholder mapping. We need to know who the, the stakeholders are within the organization. Obviously, we map them to tech leads, typically with your IT admins, if you have IT admins uh, and so on. So resource allocations, and then obviously scheduling the, the program of rollout. Change is key, um, adoption and change management, training and upskilling and measuring, measuring and analyzing how the technologies are being adopted and then remediating the rollout, the plan, the implementation to, to ensure that we're always meeting um, the, the best adoption and change management rate. Uh, the phase two is obviously the implementation, the actual rollout of the project. Uh, and those are the, the, the steps that I talked about earlier, those core setups right through to support. Um, and underlying that, you can see communication, change management, training, and user adoption is key, underlies everything that we do. It's, it's one of the, it's the key success factor we've had, um, I suppose, as the leading Microsoft 365 partner for, for Microsoft. Um, there's there's an organization who um, managed the airports in Dublin um, and they had a, a very, I won't give their name then, but they had a very poor experience um, with Office 365 but because they rolled it out as a technology. Um, they, they implemented the technology, but they didn't roll out any training, um, any change management around how people work and how they implement it and how they leverage the value of products. So, you know, it, that's why it became a flop. And then we had to, you know, go in afterwards and then uh, ensure that, that was done retrospectively. Phase two on that implementation, those core setups are typically 
it's the tenancy setting up the, the office 365 microsoft 365 tenancy active directory integrations license assignments pilot testing typically we'll start with a pilot mixed grouping so you, you have it people if you have them and then your business people um and and go through get feedback and analysis from them on um you know how we've implemented it for out of the original workshops is that still fit for purpose do we need to change anything and then we modify the design of the plan according to that feedback again that change uh, change management the communications you've got to promote to all your staff that this change is coming establish champions so um identify the enthusiastic people is typically what we do as the champions and they get additional training you know they're, they're the people typically in an office who everybody else will turn to and go what was that about you know x wednesday how do i do that again um and, and leverage the the value of those people uh, as as opposed to opinion leaders and people who go to the, the go-to people within certain departments or divisions within an organization um the 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 training, the end user training is typically done through portals, classrooms uh, or webinars, lunch and learns, loads of different mediums where you can deploy training. So really no excuse. Um, and, and I'll show you an example of a training site that we that we put in for, for customers that we've got a lot of content on. And then admin upskilling and handover. Obviously, we take the customer then a certain amount of administration, maybe setting up new accounts, how to set permissions and so forth how to use the platform effectively as an administrator an it administrator uh, deployment is migrating as i said that data is to be mailbox and data and metadata the configurations of exchange and OneDrive and uh, sharepoint teams and workspaces workspaces is is a combination of teams and sharepoint where you're getting you're leveraging the power of that that ai those insights I can go into a workspace and I can see what documents people have created recently that are relevant to me. Um, uh, data that's, I suppose, gives me insights on what's been happening lately with a customer. If I look at a customer workspace within our team's uh, SharePoint environments. So it's much more insightful, much more um, predictable around what I need to work on, what I need to focus on, rather than going looking for you know, the, the legacy uh, construct of, uh, file servers and directories and folders and subfolders and subfolders, that kind of stuff. That's uh, all gone uh, with workspaces, SharePoint teams. So early life support. Um, so typically we roll out support and uh, we look for iterative feedback as we're going through. Where, so you might train a group of users um, and as you're going through that and they get the training, you're moving on to the next group. That first group might come back and say, well, uh, could we do this better or could we do that better? So it's iterative, it's changing potentially as we go through a program of work with customers. And then we modify the content um, according to that iterative feedback. Support, as I said, uh, escalations from customer um, IT, or we can provide full managed service support. But why do these projects tend to fail? As I was saying earlier, um, the soft stuff is difficult, it's hard. Changing mindsets and attitudes is the biggest, um, I suppose, a potential challenge that we run into um, and that us customers run into all of the time. And this came from an IBM survey of 1500 organizations worldwide. Um, so other factors might include connectivity, legacy platforms like uh, management sponsorship, uh, resistance to change, but underestimating adoption and change management and that kind of stuff is, is, is key. Uh, and I think the, the, the slide speaks for itself. Leveraging the value. So again, like the message is that adoption and change management, um, top training and upskilling the users, establishing measurable success criteria. So you know what do we what do we really need to achieve with the with the technology and the tool set to 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 gain those business outcomes that we have set from the start, we've agreed from the, the initiation of the project, gather the feedback and the usage metrics and analyze the metrics and then remediate um, the, the tool set and the features accordingly. And just to give you an example, uh, so here's a, a typical um, user training portal um, that we would implement. Now, you know, this is pre-built. Um, uh, this is a pre-built uh, pre value add training portal. Uh, high quality content honed over many iterations. I can tell you, with literally tens of thousands of users, but um, gives the people a quick, easy access to how they understand, how they leverage the value of the of the content, the new the, the technology, the features, and so on. And then, as I said, that measurement, um, so this was uh, a Power BI output uh, 
showing how we're achieving measurable change. Uh, the graphs and metrics we source from Microsoft 365 and then present through Power BI. Um, then we can hone in and target training for groups that aren't perhaps adopting as effectively as others. Um, but it gives us that insight. Uh, and the final one then is one of the reports that you know you see around the adoption uh, metrics. So you can see that for this organization, there was a target of 80% and we achieved 98% target on the OneDrive adoption. And then you can see the others for, for SharePoint and Teams and so on. So important to get that uh, measurability into how we use the platform uh, and then you know, potentially focus on the areas where it isn't being leveraged so well. But make no mistake, it is a whole new way of working. Um, Microsoft Teams um, and, and SharePoint workspaces, uh, how people authenticate and become much more secure than we have in the past, much more security conscious. Um, doing things like security awareness training, um, you know, phishing campaigns that you can launch from the Microsoft 365 platform to help users better understand the potential threats out there and that kind of thing. All critical services that just, I suppose, they aren't intuitive. Um, if you think um, you're just going to um, adopt Microsoft 365 uh, just by turning on the technology, it's, it's a big mistake and there's a big gap there. So. Hopefully I brought you enough detail around um, how it gets implemented, what the typical program and process is to get us through from start to finish with a Microsoft 365 implementation and adoption. And hopefully that the key point was um, getting the staff to actually adopt and utilize the technology effectively. Thanks. Thanks, Steve, that, that, that was excellent. I mean, the... Um... The, whole, the, the, the vital importance of uh, effective project management for an organization is going down this road for the first time. Very strong point that you've made. Um, and the, the, the vital um, ingredient of having a training portal so people can understand um, all of the capabilities. But it's also interesting how you described, you know, why projects fail. And it's often the, the soft side as to why it's fail, the culture, the you know, the, the environment rather than the narrow technology itself. Um, and also, I suppose you've highlighted, yeah, exactly. The soft stuff is hard, but also this piece you mentioned around um, the danger of simply looking upon this as a technology project. So to drop and run uh, Office 365 into an organization, Microsoft 365 into an organization, is a sort of a fatal mistake that, that unfortunately some have made. Um, we made it ourselves, John. Um, so years ago, that's how we used to do it. We used, it was a technology and we we're all technologists in, in my business. And so that's what we did. We'd implement the technology, but we quickly learned that this is not just a technology. This is a way of working. And that really is, um, needs to be focused on your business. How do you operate as a business? What kind of processes do you have on a daily basis? And that's, what's been the success factor for us is understanding that and delivering on that with the technology. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, no, no, thanks. It's a, it's, a, it's a point you've made very clearly, Steve, you know, and I think, um, you know, as we move now into the, into the next part of our conversation, which is our panel discussion, you know, I think, um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the key things here is that um, there's a sense in many of our organizations on the call, there's a sense that being more personally productive was sort of optional five years ago, whereas it has become critical because of the pressures we're all under. So it's been well pointed out by Simon at the start about you know, the, the, the huge growth in the, in the volume of video calls we get invited to, meetings we get invited to. You know, Connor talked about how um, you know, there's this extraordinary uh, problem going back many years in organizations, but becoming more and more acute about adding value and spending time on the right things. And, you know, Mark also talked about this and also from the perspective of teams and how to use teams effectively. And of course, Steve rounded it off beautifully by talking about how to implement this uh, correctly. So as, as a panel then, as a panel conversation, um, I suppose, uh, you know, a, a question in the back of my mind is, is, you know, I'm thinking of an organization out there that probably has partially implemented some of the technology um, wouldn't rate itself as being an exemplar for how that was done, but it's certainly using Outlook, using Teams, 
using some of the other capabilities, but it's, but it's maybe stuck now and thinking, oh, where do I, where do I go next? So I suppose it'd be interesting to get from the panel your thoughts on, you know, what should be the first thing that such an organization should do? You know, they have Office 365, now called Microsoft 365, but it's not, it's not giving them everything that it could, and they're not sure where to go next for inspiration. So who'd like to maybe go first on that question? Maybe, I think, Simon, you're looking like somebody wants to say something. <laughs> yeah, I, I think an important thing for me, is just, there's two things I always think, right? Unfortunately, for whatever reason, over the years, Microsoft have sort of trained customers into talking about licensing and thinking about licensing in SKU terms, you know, uh, rather than really understanding the problems that they're trying to solve in order to have whatever impact or outcome or business goal that they need to meet and then aligning the, you know, the Microsoft plans to that. So, so they're the two pieces, I guess, that I would say. One piece is to be clear about prioritizing initiatives within your own organization so that you understand a little bit like what, what um, a little bit like what Mark was talking about actually about, you know, some sort of grid that shows you the high value, high priority stuff versus the sort of low value, nice to have kind of stuff that do some sort of exercise like that, that will help you understand the problems you need to solve. And then the second piece will be to match that to either the plans you have available. So then there's a little bit of an action around understanding the plan you're on because the plans are complex. And you take something like Teams, Teams didn't exist a few years ago and then was brought into some of the plans and has expanded since. So there's a little bit about understanding the capabilities that are available within, within the plans you have and then doing an alignment between which capability in the plan can help you achieve the outcome and build a plan with the likes of Steve and his team off the back of that then, you know? Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. And um, Connor, a question for you around, you know, you know personal productivity organizations over the past year and a half have gone through a lot of turmoil. Uh, a lot of people working from home, intense pressure on everybody. Um, it seems to have compounded the whole question of personal productivity. Are, are you finding that um, organizations uh, are as overwhelmed as ever? Or are you finding that generally they are more receptive to, to the idea of, of you know, taking control of their calendar. And I think you're on mute, Connor. Sorry. I was just having a little laugh to myself there uh, as, as, as you were asking the question. Um, John, you and I have had long conversations about this. I think in general, um, and, and this is not a criticism of anybody, but quite honestly, when I'm out there trying to run productivity programs, whether it's personal or team productivity, um, I, I, I see a whole load of people working very hard with the best of intentions, battered by email, instant messaging, phone calls, racing around, blah de blah de blah you know, uh, not really clear on what it is they're trying to do. In other words, back to the four quadrants, what are you trying to do? Simon has just talked about it. Do, do you even have priorities? As, as Jared Perdesat said, when he talked to his own team and they're heavy hitters up there in Microsoft, no doubt all on, you know, big, big guys, what's your personal productivity plan? They, they weren't able to answer. He said they didn't know what I was talking about, but he says now they do, now they do. So I see organizations struggling, first of all, at this. What are you trying to do? COVID has made it even worse because now not only are we all trying to do something, but I can't even see you anymore. You're all at home. <laughs> so, so, so the people who will be doing their best will still be doing their best. And I reckon a whole load of other people, as, as uh, the TD Mark McSharty said, are probably sitting at home watching box sets. Now, if I was a manager, I would be saying to people, question number one, Simon Daly, Steve Blanche, Mark Kane, you're my three oppos here. One, are you clear on your key areas? Are you clear on your quadrant twos? Do you know what you should be working on? Secondly, what tasks are you now working on? Show me some evidence that these are the tasks that you are actually working on things that are in the quadrant two bracket and adding value. And finally, if I have to ask you the third question, we're really getting tough here. Show me your calendar. Show me how much time you're spending on these things. Now, whether that's happening at home or whether that's happening at work. And I'm not saying this is all about whipping people. 
but it's a change of culture, as Steve said. We, we, we have to develop a culture of productivity. We have to get people to understand actually what productivity is. So whether it is at all, I just think COVID and homeworking has made it even worse, John, even worse. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. No, I, can, I can see it, uh, Connor, absolutely. And Mark, for, from your side then with Teams, I mean, you've seen before, during and after uh, Teams being introduced effectively. Um, what, what were some of the pitfalls that you saw along the way that maybe can give some insight uh, also to, to organizations, you know, where, where they're not fully using Teams the way you've described it, but want to, but yet, you know, old habits die hard. How, how have you, what sort of words of wisdom do you have for people on that? Um, thanks, John. Um, definitely, the, the, the first thing goes back to, uh, to governance a again. You know, you have to avoid team sprawl um, because otherwise it, it's just, it, it just ends up a mess. So for, uh, by, by default, anybody can create a team. You have to lock that down before you roll it out. I need to understand well what taxonomy do you want to build? What's the team structure? If you if you've already got a, a good SharePoint implementation, you probably have something there that you could establish from it. The the other one is that you you can't underestimate the value of ongoing training and adoption and and um, you, know, you know short sort of uh, sessions where where you can show people the value of one particular app. You know don't bombard them with sort of a a week long training session, they'll be worn out. But if you say, right, this, this lunchtime, we're gonna do 20 minutes and we're just gonna talk about planner, or we're, we're gonna say here, how you can embed your Power BI dashboard directly in here in your, in your Teams, Teams uh, channel, or, or how you can sort of uh, share an email directly to there, break it into these things and, and sort of you know, have them available uh, as, as, as short videos as well. Um, I think there's great value as well in having a learning management system, uh, whether you use something like LMS 365, they've got some great training that you can embed directly in there or now with, with Microsoft themselves, with, uh, with, with Viva for, for employee onboarding. Um, so it, it, it's really about, there, there is so much technology there, you can overwhelm people. Uh, I'd like to go, go back to the point, I think that, that Simon was, was saying as well, is that... Um, um, you know, it's not, you don't throw technology at people, sort of trying to understand, well, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Because I think if you take it a step back and look at all the technology you have, you know, a lot of organizations tend to think, okay, we have a problem, let's get a new technology in to solve it. You probably have the, the, an ecosystem of technologies uh, that can, you know, combined can do that for you. You may even find you've got multiple technologies with different groups um, using different, uh, you know, different technologies. So you can probably clear out a couple. If you've more than one document management system, you're in trouble. Um, so I, I think it, 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 it goes back to, so technology is the, the, the final point, but the, we talk about the old adage of people and then process, then technology. You can actually put one right at the start, which is a set of principles. Well, you know, what, what are the, you know, what's our ecosystem? You know, so uh, that's, that's, a, that's a, starting, a starting point. Um, in terms of the, um, I think there was a question there for everybody in terms of favorite yeah. add-in app to Teams. Yeah. Um, for, for me, it would definitely be, uh, be, be Planner um, because it's, it's something that, um, you know, this, the scenario that we all have, multiple recurring meetings, um, and we're having to keep track of everything that's been assigned to us. This gives us the opportunity to keep on top of it, uh, keep, keep control of it. And, and I didn't even delve into the other things you can do with Planner. You can use it as a Kanban board. You can use it sort of to to roll things through uh, in, in a very agile way. Um, so that, that for me would be my, my favorite one. But the, the great thing is that with, with Teams, you can add, um, you know, uh, it says website, you can essentially link to any browser-based uh, system from within there. If it's, if it's a technology that you're using in context for that category of work, um, it's all in that one place. You don't need to jump in and out of different technologies. Thanks, Mark. And we, we have a question, I think, from Ronan. I think, Ronan, you put your hand up. You want to ask a question? Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, working remotely, as you can see here. Uh, I have a question on, in relation to... We used to use CapEx to buy software, and now, obviously, software as a service, we have recurring monthly rentals. Um, and often the training element goes amiss because it's not normally included as a SaaS uh, on a SaaS 
it's not normally given in, in a, like on a monthly recurring. So our company's missing the training budget because we're all guilty of buying the latest trick um, and never reading the manual, if you like. And like, you know, even today I've learned some bits and pieces that are fundamental to me and we made reference to that. But how should we recommend to businesses or what should we recommend to businesses on learning these technologies, especially going from, you know, the gentleman from Ergo uh, and all the guys, you know, we all using software to solve problems. But however, we're all guilty of going the way we know, not necessarily learning the new tricks. So how should we recommend training um, is it the lunchtime mention of video series? Is it uh, having an archive available that we can continually reference new tricks? Is it almost like a, a marketing tool that needs to be done internally to kind of remind people and send them links to different things? Can I just throw it out to sort of around the coffee table to see what people's opinion generally is? Maybe, Steve, you want to answer first? We'll, we'll ask everyone for their view. Maybe, Steve, what, what's your sure, view? On sure. Um, so it, it takes many, many forms, to be honest. Um, large organizations, and we've done migrations for organizations of like 40,000 people, global organizations. There was one, at least plant, or a global bank. Um, and what we had with them and a lot of other organizations was classrooms, where we would go in and we would deliver a classroom, which would give you the fundamentals of, the basics of Office 365. How do I use Teams? What are Teams? How do I create meetings? What, how can I benefit from meetings? What's Planner? How do I use Schedule? Uh, and so on and so on and so on. But they would be born out of the initial discoveries, as is obviously enough, with you know, what, what is the business really going to leverage? How are we going to you know, meet business objectives? How do you work? And that kind of stuff. Um, but, but classrooms, you don't want it to be any more than two hours. You don't want any more than 15 people in a classroom. And that, that obviously in itself, just by the numbers alone, is going to consume a lot of time and resources for your organization. Um, other than that, the training portals, very easy to put up, very easy to you know, populate out to people. Lunch and Learns was another common good one that re people, uh, a lot of organizations took up really well, where you were just focusing on a small snippet. You might even just focus it on Planner, for example, in, in Teams. Um, uh, and, and I think Planner is a brilliant one. We use it all the time. Um, as part of our projects but um, then things like the training portal lunch and learns uh, classroom led and um, webinars so webinars like this where you're focusing on specific specific features record the webinar put it up on your your sharepoint space internally um, and, and let people see um, but then again it's always updating with i guess those lunch and learns typically target the champions as well to try and get them you, and you mentioned the champions network a while ago steve that's yeah. a good way i think because champion networks are, are sort of they can be peer-to-peer -peer training tools as well like so they take the burden away from the sort of higher cost training approaches if you like you know exactly i'll give you a great example um of um you were saying earlier how, how do you get where do you start, you know? Um, and one of the examples, was, let's say that, that company, Leaf Plan, for example, when we were talking to them about how they work and what they do, um, they have all these different divisional managers. And um, what was noted out to us was the real workers are their PAs. They're the one that organize all the meetings, get people going and give people tasks and follow-ups and all that kind of stuff. And they give that data back to the managers. And we were asking them, well, what's your problem? What are, how do you work? What's the challenging pieces? And they were saying, well, when we organize the meetings, we're there and we, we, know, we, we dictate the notes, take all down on the minutes, and then we'll email everybody else afterwards. So Simon, where's your uh, task? Where are, you, where are you with that? And so on and so on and so on. Uh, it's a nightmare. And then back and forward and checking up and all that kind of stuff. So again, consolidate that into meetings. Uh, at the time, Planner wasn't available, so it was with OneNote. But we integrated it with their Outlook. So when they sent out the meeting, the OneNote kicked off with the shared meeting. Um, everybody who was there then had tasks assigned potentially if there was an action in the meeting so born out of that and then you obviously automatically got noted with that got notified of that within your outlook and you could update it where you are with that action that task how far you are and she doesn't then have to go out and find out where everybody is get emailed back and forth trying to chase people she can see in real time and, that, and, and they said to us man oh man that saved so much time just on stuff that those PAs who, as I said, they said they were the real workers in the organization, just save so much time and just leveraging something as simple as that. But that's what it is. You've got to get into the business processes. What are you really going to be effective at um, on, on your day to day? 
you know, not the, not the busy, you know, not, not the estimation. It's those, those core pieces that we talked about earlier. So how are you going to be effective? What should you be working on? And how do we optimize those processes and, and, and tasks for you? Thanks, Steve. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that you'd like to share? Mark? It's probably going to make the point that it, it, it's worth having a look at what's out there. I mean, you can't obviously beat uh, the value of a good training partner, uh, you know, the, the likes of Ergo, who are your, you know, they're the deployment partner. They can help you with the training. And importantly, as Dave mentioned, adoption and change management, which is different than training. You know, training is just making material available to help people learn how to use the tools. Adoption and change management has a bit more of a focus about the cultural impact and the change that you're trying to deliver. Um, so it's worth, I just pinged a couple of links into the chat window there. There is some training with sort of videos and tips and tricks guides and downloadable assets that you can customize with your own logos and stuff that are available on the web. It's worth having a look at some of that as well and just making sure you know what's available. But I think for me, a fundamental point about building your training plan comes back to the other point that I was making about having a clear roadmap of the problems you're trying to solve, which is linked to the technology rollout then. Do you know what I mean? So you know which capabilities you're going to deliver over time and then how you're sort of, a, for lack of a better phrase, how you're building up the digital maturity of your user base, you know, of, of the employee teams and stuff like that. You know, how do you, how do you incrementally help them adopt more and more advanced kind of technology, you know? Yep, absolutely, Simon. Um, um, could I make a, a point there, John? I think, um, I think there's scope for all sorts of different training experiences. I've been in the training business for the last 25 years. My master's is in organizational behavior. So I don't come at this from a technology point of view. I come at it actually from a, from a human point of view. So for an example, I'm up here in Donegal at the moment. And uh, in order to get out to where I am, uh, you need a boat. So you need an outboard engine. And I have learned so many things from YouTube as how you replace the impeller on a, you know, 115 Suzuki. How can you do that? You can go on, you can watch a fella doing it, you can watch it a few times and you can go down and do it. Grand. It's a singular exercise. I don't have to go down with a team of people to work on the Suzuki. However, if I'm working in an organization that does air conditioning or it is a legal practice or it is mainstream renewable power or indeed it's Microsoft, Sometimes the learning has to be a shared experience because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a momentum and you're getting people to learn together and getting them to say like the fella in South Africa said, Jesus, this is brilliant. <laughs> like, I didn't know this. And he's looking at his colleague. And then you can transition that into a conversation to say, how would this help you manage your day-to-day -day productivity? How would this help you manage your clients or your new product introduction, or your, you know, your upgrades or whatever it might be. So sometimes I think learning can be an online individual experience. Brilliant. In some instances, I think it has to be a, what do you call it? A shared experience, a learning together so that you can workshop it and get them to think beyond the technology, beyond the training. How can we use this to solve real problems? Absolutely, Connor. Yeah. So it's more, yeah, that interactive nature of training as well. So it's a, it's a combination of techniques, but yeah, I almost like to workshop it out for the context of the organization as much as anything exactly. else. Yeah. Um, so for, for an organization then that, you know, uh, doesn't have this technology at all, some organizations are not using Microsoft for their uh, email or um, they're not using Teams, they're not using anything at all. So they, they would come, come at this completely cold. Um, what about for those organizations? I mean, so we talked a bit about organizations that already have Office 365, Microsoft 365, and it's a case of, well, how can we use it more productively? How can we be more productive? But if, if someone is coming in completely cold, they've never seen anything like this at all before, um, maybe Simon, on, on that scenario, what, what's their what's their recommended starting point? For me, it, it's the same conversation about well, what are the organizational priorities and initiatives, and where are they going to start? Because that's the piece that allows you to map, as I said, the, the sort of technology capabilities to delivering the program of work that you want to drive the business outcomes, and then from that, you know, I mean, typically you would engage with a, a licensing partner of some kind, 
or or through the likes of Microsoft, we, we do sort of art of the possible sessions to help people understand, well, what are all the different bits that you don't know at the moment? Most of the time, organizations that are coming at it from, from sort of, you know, it, they don't have cloud technology, but they have the on-prem equivalents probably. They probably have Exchange. They may or may not have SharePoint. They'll have probably a version of Office, unless, of course, they're, you know, they're on a, a, comp- a competitor kind of solution, which probably means then they're looking at cloud in the first place, you know? So, you know, for me, it comes back to some of those principles and some of those basics. The big one in the last few years has been, um, there is an enterprise foundations guide actually that's probably worth looking at because when you're planning, you know, if you get to the point of saying, right, I want to modernize my email and that means I'm going to look at going to the cloud and I want to hit some of the new ways of working, which include Microsoft Teams, then some of the foundational planning you're going to have to look at are things like identity and access management. So what's the state of your active directory? What are you going to do about, for example, mobile device management or mobile workers? What are your considerations around information protection? Do you have concerns around, for example, I, I cover public sector and health now. So a lot of the questions that we've been getting in the last year or so are around things like data residency, data, data kind of sovereignty and stuff like that. So are there legal and compliance type implications in your, your business that mean you need to do a bit more due diligence? There's actually, um, there's actually a portal, I can even ping the link in, there, we provide a set of due diligence checklists for, for assessing cloud providers on what we call the service trust portal. Now they're not Microsoft specific, so you can apply the due diligence tech checklist to any cloud provider, but it looks at those sort of factors around, you know, data residency concerns, you know, maybe certifications, regulatory kind of uh, standards that need to be followed, stuff like that, security, privacy, um, some of the operational considerations around, you know, backups and things like that. So, you know, you, you know, as I said, it, it's definitely down to understanding what it is that you're trying to do and then performing the due diligence on what it is you believe you need to, to sort of line up, you know? Yeah, thanks. thanks. Well, just if I could go back to um, something you said right at the start. So, you know, cybersecurity is as important as physical security. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that's, uh, that, that's something, if, if you're talking about, you know, companies who are you know, still on premise, you know, back in, back in 20. 13, I remember it was, you know, when, when we had started our cloud journey and, uh, you know, we roadblocks thrown in our way, you know, was the cloud safe? And even Microsoft had to publish articles to say, was the cloud safe? We now know it's the safest place to be. Um, you know, when, when, the, when the big solar winds hack was, was uncovered, uh, it was also later on discovered that the, uh, the hackers who tried to deploy it to, to all these uh, different, different servers they, if they identified something as being an Azure server, they didn't deploy it there, not because they didn't uh, want to, it's because they knew they'd be detected. So uh, that, that was for, for, for us with, you know, with, with Recoleta, we chose Microsoft Azure, one, primarily because of the sustainability credentials of Microsoft, but secondarily because of the cybersecurity credentials. So really organizations need to realize, you know, c- cybersecurity is, is one of the top risks to their to their existence. You know, we've, we've all seen what's happened now with the, the, the HSE, what it's gonna cost them to get back, uh, what will they get back, what have they, what have they lost for, for forever? So that's probably, you know, um, if we talk about, you know, what, what are the business challenges, let, let's start with what are the, the, the risks to the continued existence of organizations? And if their cybersecurity strategy isn't, uh, isn't, isn't watertight, uh, that's probably the best place to start. Yeah. Yep. So we'll we'll. Uh, th- does anyone have any other questions from the audience they'd like to ask? Looks like Ronan has his hand up. He might. That might be from earlier, though. I think it's from earlier. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll we'll move on from this part of the conversation. Um, yeah. No. It's. I, I. I think it's been very insightful listening to our our speakers um, this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to do next is, is uh, talk a little bit about how to engage with the Data Value Hub, and then I'll do a sort of a summary at the end. So um, we've no, I don't think we've got any more questions. I'll ask one more time. I don't think so. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll move on. So engaging with the Data Value Hub, I mentioned already we're here to help enterprises compete, and we do that in three ways. The first thing we look at is um, enterprise maturity. So. Some of you have seen this chart already. If you think about Intel in LeakSlip, they are an exemplar for digital maturity and process maturity. So they're at level five on on this chart. 
They're using Lean Sigma in their processes extensively, and they're using artificial intelligence extensively in their business. Now, most businesses um, that, are, that are operating in Ireland are probably at a level three or a level two, to be, to be fair to them. However, the challenge we all have as organizations is that we have to assume that any competitor we're facing is on the path to level five. And we really don't want to be the last one to get there. You know, the world of, of you know, making better decisions faster is all about being at level five on this chart. To advance from level two to level five is all about a specific journey for a specific organization. You have to look at the cost benefit step by step on that. And you also have to look at the pace of change that you can absorb. But the pressure we're all feeling is this phenomenal necessity to be much more productive as we go about that. When we look at projects then for organizations, our focus is on how can we help organizations to get this technology into their hands, specifically technology around artificial intelligence. Does the organization have an idea about how it can run the business better, faster, simpler, and cheaper? As Connor pointed out, not only efficiency, but effectiveness, value. And if they do, can they describe the benefit? Can the organization commit its time? And does the organization have data? And if, if, the, if the answer is yes, we're, we're then here to help. Today was all about helping on, on the third point, upskilling. So point number one, assessment. Point number two, projects. Point number three, upskilling. So we will continue uh, after the summer with another program of, of uh, upskilling events. All of our events we publish on our YouTube channel. Um, and that's part of our digital presence. Um, this event, we'll put it up in the next 24 hours. Um, and uh, I encourage you to search for us if you haven't got the link on YouTube to do that. You'll also find links on our LinkedIn page and of course our, our homepage are on, our, on, our, uh, on our website. Our office is in right in the center of the Northeast region. Um, several of the people on the call today are not from the Northeast region. Our, our approach is not narrowly defined by just the Northeast. It's primarily where we operate, but we will work with businesses right across Ireland. Um, the, the closing thoughts from myself, just before I wrap up, would you know to say that we are in an, in, a, in an era where it's all about digitizing to win. Um, we're all under pressure to become more productive. We are being inundated with constant bombardment of invitations to digital meetings, emails, et cetera, on a, on a, on a scale and at a pace we hadn't seen ever in history before. This is the whole thing around accelerated digitization. We simply have to accept that our customer is demanding more from us, demanding faster and better and cheaper and demanding it all now. So I'd like to just thank our speakers. And um, I, I think for those who've been on the session all afternoon, I think you'd, you'd probably agree with me that this has been a very, very insightful um, update from, from Simon and Connor and Mark and Steve. And I'd like to thank each of you for, for your time today to, to share with us your ideas, guys. So really, thank you very much. Um, that's really all we've got for this afternoon. We will pick up the program of webinars at the end of the summer in September. And um, if anyone on the call has any questions for me, you know, please contact me. And we're, we're here to help in any way we can to help you become more productive with Office 365. Thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks, everybody else. Thanks, all. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bye. Thank you.